Welcome to Module 3, Section 11, where I will discuss the Fed. The agency that's probably going to have the most impact on individual investors is going to be the Fed. They're the most in-your-face out of all the different government agencies that oversee the securities markets or the stock market in particular. The Federal Reserve, better known as the Fed, is the bank of the U.S. government and as such regulates the nation's financial institutions or banks. So it's the Federal Reserve that oversees the banking system in the U.S. The Fed watches over the world's largest economy in the U.S. and is therefore one of the most influential organizations on Earth. If the Fed acts, the world listens. The Fed dictates economic and monetary policies that have profound impacts on individuals in the U.S. and around the world. So yeah, they're pretty important. So whenever they say something or whenever they do something, it gets a lot of attention. There is a tutorial that you can go to at investopedia.com, which is kind of helpful. It's just a short little video that gives an overview on the Fed. So here's the symbol. It's not a very pretty symbol, just black and white with the eagle. And they also have their own flag, which is blue, basically, also with the eagle. So let's go back and talk about a, the brief history of the Fed. It was created in 1913. Now, other things were also created in 1913, such as the federal income tax. Well, the Fed was also created at that time. Our president was Woodrow Wilson. This is before World War I. And he kept promising, we will not enter the war. We will not enter the war. Well, what did America do in 1917? It entered the war. Some people really like the contributions that Wilson did to America. Other people think that he overstepped his bounds and just had too much government control and a lot of the segregation that we've had throughout the 20th century, they say, came from him. But there was an act called the Federal Reserve Act that was passed in 1913, which created the Fed. This was mainly in response to a series of financial panics, particularly a severe panic in 1907. You may not have even heard about that. And I have other videos where I talk about panics and crashes and times when the markets went through really difficult times. But this one is not as famous as what would come later in 1929. They had a severe panic in 1907. Wilson eventually comes in and becomes president. And he says, we need to do something about that. And so out of that came the Federal Reserve. Over time, the roles and responsibilities of the Federal Reserve system have expanded and its structure has evolved. Isn't it that way with pretty much every government agency? A lot of times agencies are created for a short-term purpose, but then they never seem to go away. And then there's another problem, so they create another agency. And now you often have a duplication of roles, agencies that are fixing the problem one way, and you have another agency that's trying to fix that same problem in a different way. And it leads to this big bureaucracy and this real complex government system. The Fed is like that too. But it's mostly been in response to problems that we've had. Events such as the Great Depression and the 1930s were significant factors leading to changes in the system. Which is kind of interesting. One of the reasons people give for the Federal Reserve not being able to exist is... Look what happened. It was created in 1913. Then we had the 1929 crash and then the depression of the 1930s and then so forth up till the current time. I thought the Fed was supposed to stop those things. Well, it hasn't. So I'll leave it up to you to determine is the world a better place or is America a better place because of the Fed or is it a worse place because of the Fed? So what are the defined roles of the Fed? What are they supposed to do? The U.S. Congress established three key objectives for monetary policy in the Federal Reserve Act. This is their job. The first one is maximum employment. Yes, if somebody wants a job, they should be able to have a job. And the things that the Fed does should be able to promote the ability to get a job and to keep a job. Also, allow for stable prices. When prices really go up, that's inflation. When prices really go down, that potentially could be deflation. And it's the Fed's job to see prices and to help them from getting out of line, specifically inflation, where prices go up really fast, but you're not seeing accompanied economic growth to go with it. That's what we saw in the 1970s with hyperinflation. And then to moderate long-term interest rates. Now, they don't actually moderate long-term interest rates directly. What they do is they adjust short-term, overnight lending rates. And they don't even do that directly. 
What they do is they come together and signal a range. We want you to be between 1% and 2%. And as long as you're within that range, we're happy. Now, it's a lot different right now. And I'll go through and talk about the different interest rates that we're currently dealing with. But that is their job. And this is the one that probably gets them the most amount of attention. They're also to provide oversight as well as reports. And a lot of the reports that I get and some of the diagrams and pictures that I will show you later came directly from the Federal Reserve. So the Fed's duties have expanded over the years. Imagine that. And as of 2009, also include supervising and regulating banks. Hmm, private bank managed by a public organization. Some people have a real problem with that. That is called fascism. When you have the merging of private and public together and it's controlled by the government, other people say, no, 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 no. We need somebody to oversee the banks. These people are all crooks. We've got crony capitalists out there who will take us for all we're worth if we give them a chance. So we need to oversee them and make sure that they're playing by the rules. Also, maintaining the stability of the financial system. Just want to make sure that the U.S. dollar maintains some kind of value, especially within the U.S. as well as around the world. And there's also even been talk about the U.S. government adopting some form of cryptocurrency in the future. Digital dollars. Companies like Bitcoin and Doge and all these other cryptocurrency makers, Ethereum, they may not really like that because if governments come in and take control over cryptocurrencies, where is that going to leave these private companies? And nobody can really answer that right now. People have their opinions. We need to base things on fact, not just what people think is right or wrong, because what's going to happen is what's going to impact us as individual investors. They're also to provide financial services to depository institutions. That's where you make deposits. The U.S. government and foreign official institutions. The U.S. has institutions spread throughout the whole world, and it's the Fed's job to oversee those different banks within other countries. The Fed conducts research on the economy and then releases numerous publications, such as the Beige Book. Now, this is a very inventive name because beige is a very inventive color, and that's the cover of the book. And it's released once a month, about an hour before the market closes, and rarely do the markets even pay attention to this. But it's information that's out there, and some people take this information and dive into it and try to interpret what's really going on. So what is the structure of the Fed? The Federal Reserve System is composed of presidentially appointed Board of Governors. It's also called the Federal Reserve Board, FRB. And these people are like rock stars these days. They're considered to be very important. There's also partially presidentially appointed people that make up what is called the FOMC or Federal Open Market Committee. And this is the one that gets everybody's attention because about every six weeks or so they meet and they try to decide what are we going to do about interest rates? Is there an inflationary problem on the horizon? Well, if so, then we better raise interest rates. Is the economy really going down? We better lower interest rates. There's also 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks located throughout the U.S. And I have a map of that here in just a second. And there are numerous privately owned U.S. member banks as well and various advisory councils. So they can pretty much have anybody they want come in and tell them, we think you ought to do this. We think you ought to do that. So they can expand this pretty much to be as big as they feel they need it to be. So here is the map where you can see all the different regions that the Fed oversees. I'm from the West Coast. The main bank is in San Francisco, but there is another satellite bank in Seattle. These are the main banking centers. And then every six weeks, the members that oversee these banks go to Washington, D.C. and try to decide what they're going to do about interest rates. The Fed is one of the agencies that can actually produce income as well as profits. So the U.S. government receives all of the Fed's annual profits. Isn't that nice? The Fed might make the money, but any proceeds end up going to the Treasury Department. The profits started to rise as of 2008 because we had the meltdown then. And the Fed began implementing quantitative easing. And I have a whole nother video that talks about QE. What this did is it pumped money into the U.S. banking system by buying U.S. and mortgage bonds. So this was a public entity going in and buying public debt. Hmm. Do you see a little problem there? The Fed creates this debt and then the Fed goes in and buys the same debt. Hmm. 
A lot of people think that's going to lead to a lot of inflation because this is how money is introduced into the system. We call it the money supply. And when new money is created, they go in and they buy bonds. Well, when they buy, this keeps interest rates low, which is kind of cool. But now you have all this extra money in the system. What's that going to do to the value of the dollar that you already have? If there's a whole lot of other dollars out there, it's going to make them depreciate in value. Or another word for that is inflation. In 2015, the Fed started to raise interest rates and they stopped quantitative easing programs which resulted in a decline in yearly profits. So the idea is when the U.S. economy is really in trouble, which it is right now as I record this in 2021, although the growth that we're seeing in the economy is mainly due to what the Fed is doing and the different packages that Congress have passed for stimulus packages. But the idea is that when the economy really needs help, the Fed will go in and do things that it helps stimulate the economy once the economy gets stimulated, they can stop doing that and then they start to sell off those different bonds, whether they be government bonds or even corporate bonds, and then lower their overall balance sheet. And I have a picture of that that I'll show in just a moment. In 2019, the Fed estimated their income to be $55.5 billion, down from $63.1 billion in 2018. This is when they were tapering, and that's a word that you might hear from time to time. Right now, the Fed has been ratcheting things up in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and they're buying $120 billion a month in U.S. and corporate bonds. When things finally look to stabilize, they will then stop buying bonds and eventually start to sell those bonds back into the market. Back in 2018 and 2019, the Fed was going through this tapering process, and that's why you see their value go down that's on their balance sheet. Due to COVID-19, the Fed has lowered interest rates all the way to zero, which is where they currently reside, and is implementing QE as well as purchasing corporate bonds. Some people think this is what is needed. Other people say, no, this is fascism all the way. And I write about fascism on my blog because it's a term that people use and they accuse other people of being fascist, but nobody really seems to understand what it really means. So if you want to dive more into that, look at some of the other articles that I have on my blog, as well as the videos that I post. You can find different information at the website link that is provided down below, just about how they're buying additional corporate bonds, as well as government bonds. So here is a, the actual Fed balance sheet. If you go to Google and you just type in Fed balance sheet, It'll bring you to this, where you can see over on the left-hand side in 2008, the Fed started to really increase the number of bonds that were on their balance sheet. And that continued through 2010, up through 2012, up into 2014. Then it leveled off in 2015, 16, 17. And then slowly but surely in 2018 and 2019, you can see that line starting to go down a little bit they started to sell off a lot of the bonds that they had purchased. Well, then COVID-19 hit and everything went crazy and has stayed crazy ever since. Not only did the interest rates get thrown down to zero, but QE, quantitative easing, has been implemented. Money is created that's introduced into the system by buying bonds. Who buys those bonds? The Fed. And so its balance sheet gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as I stated earlier, they're currently buying about $120 billion in bonds every month. So this figure just keeps going up and up and up. This chart can be a little bit misleading because you see over on the right hand side, it says 8M, 8 million. Well, if you look down at the very bottom, it says total assets in millions. So that's millions of millions, which means trillions. So the Fed currently has over $8 trillion on its balance sheet a number that most people can't even begin to comprehend. And this number is going up all the time. Some people think this is necessary, especially those that adhere to modern monetary theory, which I have another video that covers that, where the government can just print more and more money. And if you need to throw stimulus checks to people to keep them happy, do that. When things finally get to the point where there's some kind of inflation, well, the Fed just raises interest rates and taxes. And that'll take care of everything. And then when that gets too high and the economy starts to go down, you just print more money over and over. It's like 
Keynesian economics on steroids. Okay, if some of you might know what that means, but there's going to be a reckoning day with the economic system that is used within the U.S. right now. Now, the reckoning may be that that was the right thing to do and everything will turn out fine. The other reckoning may be this was the wrong thing to do and we have some real problems in the U.S. This diagram just shows the remittances to the U.S. Treasury. As they sell things off, the profits are then passed over to the U.S. Treasury. And this is just a diagram showing how that has occurred. You can see in 2017 where we had $80.6 billion. And then it really fell off in 2019 to $54.9 billion. Well, the estimation for 2020 is it will be up in the $88.5 billion. Now, that's just an estimation, and this information is long in coming. So you can't really base a lot of decisions on this because the lag time is just so great. The Fed is also supposed to have a level of independence. So the Fed considers the Federal Reserve System, quote, an independent central bank. Alexander Hamilton set really the foundation for the first federal bank. That fizzled out after a period of time, and then Woodrow Wilson revitalized this in 1913 to what we have today. So the central bank, because its monetary policy decisions do not have to be approved by the president or anyone else in the executive or legislative branches of the government. So whatever the Fed does, the president or Congress, unless they pass some kind of legislation that says the Fed can't do this, the Fed can do whatever it wants. And that's kind of good. They are independent. They don't have the political pressures that Congress people or the president have. This is also one reason why Donald Trump, back when he was allowed on Twitter, apparently presidents are not allowed the First Amendment, and most people in America are not also not allowed to have the First Amendment anymore. But he would get on there when the Fed would do something and say, why are you guys raising interest rates? You should be lowering them. He's a businessman, so you would expect him to say that. But they're independent. You'd think, well, gee, Donald Trump's a president. If he wants something to happen, don't you think that should happen? No. The Fed is separate from the president. And they can do things that the president either agrees or disagrees with. And it does not receive funding appropriated by Congress. And in the terms of the members of the Board of Governors, they can span multiple presidential and congressional terms. So they don't have the same political pressures that politicians do. Just as an example, one of the past chairmen is Alan Greenspan. He was appointed under Ronald Reagan, and he was the chairman of the Fed all the way up until 2006, which was the end of George W. Bush's term. So he spanned multiple presidents, both Democrat and Republican. However, President Trump is the first president to criticize the actions of the Fed. I never heard any president lambasting or criticizing the Fed. Now, if they did... It was probably in private, and it was never reported to the public. But Donald Trump would get on his Twitter account and just go crazy, thinking that the Fed was doing the wrong thing. But to give him credit, when he liked what the Fed was doing, he would say that as well. And remember, he was not a politician. He is a businessman, so he wants things to happen that are more business-friendly. And of course, a lot of people think now, does our current president even know the Fed exists? Hmm, interesting thought. So the current Fed chairman is Jerome Powell. So he is one of the most powerful people on the planet. He first assumed the role in 2018. Here's what he looks like. And you'll see him on TV quite a bit. And anytime this guy makes a speech or any of the other Fed governors, man, they just watch for every intonation of their speech. They look for every word that they write. They're trying to find all kinds of secret meaning in what is happening. Just to give you an idea, the previous Fed chair person was Janet Yellen from 2014 to 2018. She's currently the Treasury Secretary. Some people have a problem with that. Wait a minute, you ran the Fed and now you're part of the current administration? That's not right. Where other people say, sure, why not? She's a very smart lady. Maybe she has some good advice to give. Take your pick as to what you feel should be the right thing. We're not concerned with how we feel about things. We're just looking at these different organizations that can impact the stock market and what does that mean to us as far as our investments. And here's a picture of Chairperson Janet Yellen. Also, 
if you have been involved in the markets for a while, there was a gentleman from 2006 through 2014 named Ben Bernanke. I have to admit, I read his book. It wasn't very good. I really wouldn't recommend it. During his time was when we had the major financial meltdown in 2007, 8, and beyond. I didn't really like his stance on things. The fact that he was trying to play the victim instead of being a leader during that time. And he just pleaded ignorance to a lot of things. And it's like, wait a minute. In some ways, you're more powerful than the president. And you're claiming that you didn't know some of these things were going on. That's not right. You need to know and understand what in the world is happening. And if you need to jump in and do something about that. Then somebody who I mentioned a little while ago, Alan Greenspan, who was appointed under President Reagan all the way up until 2006. And for the longest time, I thought he was always going to be the Fed chairman. Because back in the 90s, when I really got involved in the stock market, he had been the chairman for a long time. And it looked like he was always going to be the Fed chairman. It's kind of like FDR back in the 1930s. People just thought he was always going to be president because we didn't have the two term limit rule that we have now. And that's obviously a very old picture of Alan Greenspan. He looks much different now. Now we have the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, and they set monetary policy. This means interest rates, or are we going to enact quantitative easing or not? Are we going to buy corporate bonds and government bonds or both? The members of the FOMC consist of all seven members of the Board of Governors that are appointed by the President and approved by the Senate. The 12 regional bank presidents, where I showed you the map. The Federal Reserve System has both private and public components to serve the interests of public and private banks. Some people think this is good. Some people think it's not so good. This is what we usually focus on as individual investors. The FOMC has eight regularly scheduled meetings during the year and other meetings as needed. Just to let you know, after 9-11, the market was closed for a week. The FOMC got together and they lowered interest rates by a full percent. It barely made any news because of all the other things that were going on. But the FOMC can meet on an as-needed basis during an emergency situation. But they have regularly scheduled meetings as well. And those are freely available. I'll show you a website where you can see when the next meeting is coming up. Policy statements and minutes are available at federalreserve.gov. And a lot of people just wait for this. This is their life. They like to read through these things and find out what's really going on in the world as it applies to the Fed. The minutes of regularly scheduled meetings are released three weeks after the date of a policy decision. It used to be the FOMC would meet and then it just kind of, okay, the FOMC met yesterday. Oh, really? I guess I didn't realize that. Now... My goodness, there's a countdown and all the financial channels are all focused on it. And it's usually about 11 a.m. Pacific time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern time. And they just wait for some kind of an announcement. And the markets are usually quiet before that. And they're waiting to see what is going to happen, if anything. And then after that happens, the markets can go crazy. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in a minute. Not only is this a big deal when they adjourn their meeting, Three weeks later, the minutes from the meeting are also released and the market sometimes will just sit there with bated breath wondering, what do they say during this meeting? Do we need to freak out? Is there something that has to gyrate the markets around? It's become pretty interesting and a very interesting thing to watch. Now we'll look at market impact. The Fed can impact the financial markets. Yes, and sometimes in a pretty severe way. This can happen through FOMC meeting announcements. We've raised interest rates a quarter of a percent, or we've lowered interest rates to zero. Those kind of announcements can really send the markets going all over the place. The Federal Reserve Board's Open Market Committee is the single most important federal agency to the stock market. So it's the one that we really keep an eye on. When I do my daily and weekly videos, I will often say, tomorrow the FOMC is meeting. Or in my weekly video, I might say, this week the FOMC will be meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday, and they will make their announcement at the conclusion of their meeting on Wednesday. Its action or inaction concerning interest rates has immediate consequences for investors. Sometimes, for those of you that are members of my program, I might go live during those times, and we'll just sit and watch. We don't necessarily make decisions during that time, but it is an interesting thing just to observe and see how the market overreacts in some of these situations. The stock market anticipates what action the Fed will take, and if that doesn't happen, 
it can cause chaos. If it thinks they're going to raise interest rates and it doesn't, whoa, look out. And the opposite is also true. To be fair, the Fed usually does what the market tells it to do. And in a full capitalist society, the Fed should be doing what the markets are telling it to do. And if they don't, that could really create some problems. The Fed controls key interest rates and its actions can have a direct impact on the stock market. Usually this is for a short period of time. If the market is already in an uptrend and the Fed comes out and does something that shocks the markets, it'll make front page news, it'll be on headlines and everything, but that usually only lasts for a short period of time. And then the markets will eventually resume the trend that they were resuming before, whether it's up or down. Since the members of the FOMC are like rock stars now, everything they say and everything they do can have an impact on the market. If somebody didn't like their dinner, if somebody gets sick, if somebody goes in for surgery, that can have an impact on the markets, especially when they go around and they give speeches. It may not be just the chairperson who gives a speech. It may be one of the other members and somebody latches on to that and just goes crazy and the markets end up reacting to that. As I record this, that happened recently where one of the other Fed governors made a speech on the news and that was in opposition to what people feel the Fed had been saying and that caused a couple of days of gyration in the markets. This chart is a little bit old. This goes back to 2015 and this was the first time since 2008 when the Fed actually decided to raise interest rates. This is an intraday chart. So each bar on this chart is 10 minutes and I use candlesticks and this is what I watch. This is the S&P 500. Where I have it shaded over on the right hand side in that kind of baby blue color there, that's when the Fed made their announcement. You can see right before that the market was pretty quiet with an upward bias. And we all knew this was going to happen. There was no secret at all that the Fed was going to raise interest rates for the first time in nine years. But people decided to freak out anyway. So when the announcement was made, you can see how prices gyrated up and then immediately gyrated down. You can also see at the bottom over on the right hand side, volume massively increased. Just to put this into a little more context, this is Fed announcement day plus one. So this is not only the day that they made their announcement, this is also the next day. And you can see how market participants decided to react to that. This was not a secret. If you study the markets at all, you knew this was coming, but there are still people that freak out anyway. If you have a family member or a friend and you know they're going to pass away, it's just a matter of time and you're ready for that and you're prepared for it. But then when it finally happens, you still are in a bit of shock because now it's really happened. Maybe that's what a lot of market participants do. They know interest rates are going to be raised, but they don't really react to it until after it happens. We should also talk about a thing called the Fed funds rate. This is the overnight lending rate between high quality banks. And just to maintain liquidity, just to keep money flowing back and forth, banks do loan to each other just for one night. And there's an interest rate that is attached to that. The Fed funds rate is one of the most influential interest rates in the U.S. economy and even in the world for that matter, since it affects monetary and financial conditions, which in turn can have a bearing on key aspects of the larger U.S. economy, which includes employment, growth, and inflation. So setting interest rates is a big deal, and that's why the markets really pay attention to this. The FOMC, which is the primary monetary policy making body, telegraphs its desired target rate. They don't actually come out and say, this is what the interest rate is going to be. They come out and say, this is the range that we would like it to be. And we'd be really happy if all the banks follow this advice. So they have a desired target rate for the Fed funds rate through the open market operations, also known as the Fed funds rate. And I follow that and you'll see a chart here in just a moment. This is a website that we can go to called the Fed Watch Tool, where before the Fed even meets, there's a countdown, believe it or not. It's like a rocket taking off to go to the moon. They have a countdown, how many days, hours, minutes, and seconds until the Fed makes their announcement. But every day this is recalculated and it says what are the probabilities that interest rates are going to be changed at the next meeting. 
As I record this, we're about three weeks away from a Fed meeting. Right now, according to this diagram, there's a 100% probability that the Fed will keep rates at the same range that they are right now. They're not suggesting any movement by the Fed. As we get closer, this will become more and more important. If there are deviations from this stance, you might see 100% go to 75% and maybe 25% of economists think, no, they're going to raise it even more. So different economists will have their different opinions and they're surveyed and they watch market action to come up with this calculation. I don't watch this on a daily basis. I usually start watching it a few days before the FOMC is getting ready to meet. It's freely available, and I'll also put the link to this Fed Watch tool in the description below this video. One of the things that we can look at is the S&P versus the Fed funds rate, and I've used this chart in other videos. The idea is that rising interest rates are bad for stocks. That's the premise. Well, I tested that theory out and really concluded the opposite. In a good, healthy environment, you'll see not only the stock market go up, but you'll see interest rates go up as well. And if you think about it, that makes sense. As the economy is growing, prices go up, people are making money in the stock market, people are getting raises, stores start to raise their prices, and you start to see inflation creep into the picture. So that doesn't get out of hand, the Fed will eventually come in and raise interest rates with the idea that now it costs more to borrow money, and that will help stop stimulating the economy as much and slow it down to avoid runaway inflation. Looking at this chart, the red line is the Fed funds rate, where the black line is the S&P 500. And I go back all the way to 1980 and compare the Fed funds rate with the S&P 500. There are times when the two move in tandem with each other. There's not very many times when they move in opposite directions. Usually if we're having some kind of a problem, the Fed will be lowering interest rates, which the market likes, and so it will go up. But where I do see a really strange picture is over where I see from 2009 up through 2015, when we first raised interest rates, you'll notice that the interest rates stayed at zero during that whole time, but the stock market was really recovering nicely. You're not seeing a corresponding rise in interest rates at that point. That's because of quantitative easing. A lot of the market was propped up by the government, not necessarily by people making good investments. Now, if you had investments during that time, you saw really nice returns. But there was a lot of manipulation going on. And the same thing is happening right now. You look way over to the right-hand side. The current Fed funds rate is back at zero. We see all this liquidity getting dumped into the market, but yet the stock market is hitting all-time highs. The goal of what I teach is not to judge, not to say this is right or this is wrong. That's for another time. What I do is I take the information and I take it for what it is and I just say, based on this, stocks are likely to go up or based on this, stocks are likely to go down. That's all I personally care about. What is the impact on the stock market? There are also some other banks that we need to look at in addition to the Fed. For U.S. investors, the Fed has always been the main focus concerning interest rates, and it is the most powerful. But over the last few decades, as we've grown to more of a global economy, there are global influences that can really have a big impact on U.S. markets. So it's necessary to follow the actions or inactions of other banks outside of the U.S., and I do this, and in the daily and weekly videos that I do, I talk about these things. This can include the European Central Bank, or ECB, which sets monetary policy for the European Union. Sometimes they have a big influence on the U.S. stock market, sometimes they don't. Also the Bank of Japan, which sets the monetary policy for Japan. These are the big three. The Fed, the Bank of Japan, European Central Banks. Those are the ones that I watch the most, with the Fed leading at the top. Other banks outside the U.S. are important, but currently the Fed, ECB, and Bank of Japan are the main players. If you're interested, I just threw up some books that I've read recently about the Fed. Some people find this interesting. Other people think, oh my gosh, kill me. Ron Paul, who you may know his son, Rand Paul, who's currently a sitting congressperson. His father wrote a book, Ron Paul, talking about how the Fed should be ended that it's unconstitutional and it's bad for the U.S. He's more of a libertarian. He's further out on the right, and he doesn't believe in all this government intervention. 
There's also a more recent book called Fed Up by Danielle DiMartino Booth. No relation to John Wilkes, okay? She's kind of become very well known in economic circles these days. Very interesting book, very good perspective because she served in the Federal Reserve System. The other two books are written by a man named Edward Yardeni, and I would recommend anything that he writes is worth reading. He has a lot of free information on his website. He's very knowledgeable, and he's kind of the rock star economic person these days. He has one book that is available on Amazon called Fed Watching for Fun and Profit. Now, doesn't that just sound like a party? And he also has another book called The Fed and the Great Virus Crisis. And they're not very expensive. They're 2 or $3 for his different Kindle books that he has available. And he has a lot of really useful information at his website. And so I would highly recommend knowing who he is and paying attention to what he says, even if you disagree. This concludes Module 3, Section 11, and I will pick things up again in Section 12.